Welcome everyone to the family education webinar provided by the Family Medical Coping Initiative at Boston Children's Hospital and we're so glad that you're joining us. Um, for those of you who are new to us, I'll tell you the Family Medical Coping Initiative is a program through the Hale Family Center for Families at Boston Children's and we're a multidisciplinary effort spearheaded by psychology, social work, and child life. And this program was developed to provide education to families and to staff about ways to enhance child and family coping with the impact of children's medical conditions, medical procedures, and interactions with the healthcare environment. So today's webinar is being presented by the Family Medical Coping Initiative team. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Erica Lee, who is going to be joining us as a guest presenter is unexpectedly unavailable today but I'm delighted to introduce my colleagues, Dr. Elisa Bronfman, who is a psychologist who's been working with medically ill children at Boston Children's for more than 25 years, and Gail Winmuller, who's a certified child life specialist, who's been at Boston Children's working with a wide variety of patients for more than a decade. And I'm Annie Banks. I'm a social worker in the Hale Family Center for Families at Boston Children's. And I've been working with families in medical settings for more than 30 years. So I'm going to be monitoring your questions in the chat today. Um, if you have them, feel free to enter them. Um, and we'll either try to answer them during the course of the presentation or at the end, we'll have time for a QA. and a um, And we may not be able to answer your questions about your individual child or family circumstance, but we are happy to answer general questions about this topic. And if we don't get to all of your questions here, we'll follow up with you via email sometime after the presentation. Um, also, this presentation is being recorded and a link to the recording will be sent to you in the near future. And now, without further ado, <laughs> let's get on to our presentation. So what are we gonna be talking about today? Um, we're gonna to be talking about, of course, um, helping your child to cope with anxiety. And um, first we're gonna answer the question, what is anxiety exactly? What are common worries for kids of different ages? When is worry a good thing and when is it a problem? Um, what can worry look like in a medical environment? what helps and what doesn't when dealing with child worries in a medical environment. And um, we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about how can thinking about feelings be helpful um, and how can you encourage thinking about feeling. So first let's talk about what is anxiety? Of course, it's a sense of worry, fear, or distress in response to a real um, or perceived threat or danger. So if you think of us as human beings, um, and human beings are animals, um, and there's a very <laughs> old part of our brain um, that focuses on our safety. Um, and so if you think about, you know, once upon a time, human beings, we were living in caves, we are, um, were under constant threat, afraid of animals and other things. Um, being anxious, being scared, serves a very important function in survival and safety. Um, and that's a real threat. Um, but we also have perceived threats. So we respond that way, even in response to, uh, for instance, public speaking, <laughs> for one thing, you know, we can feel very distressed and very threatened. Um, and that is a perceived threat, uh, maybe not a real threat. So how do we know that anxiety exists? Um, again, if we think about this very uh, primal part of our brain and our body, there are certain things that happen. We have body sensations. I'll talk about those a little bit more. Um, there are thoughts related to anxiety, sometimes having repeated um, thoughts of worrisome thoughts um, are common factor in anxiety, emotions, and certainly there are behaviors that show that we and our children are anxious. So the body's response to anxiety or fear is flight, fight, or freeze. And again, if you think about um, being presented with um, a fear, um, for instance, as I said, in terms of safety, you know, um, being confronted with an animal in the wild, there are three things that our body 
is is um, kind of programmed to do. Flight, which means we run away. Fight, <laughs> which means we go after the source of the thing that is frightening us. Or freeze, we become immobile. Um, that is what we're programmed to do. And you often see, you know, they'll be sweating. People start breathing fast when they're scared. Um, sometimes stomach ache, sometimes shaking. Certainly um, the heart is beating fast. The heart rate goes up and it can be very hard to think because all of our systems are put into um, this flight, fight or freeze mode. So is anxiety good or bad? Well, it's on a spectrum and it can function a lot of different ways. So anxiety, of course, as I mentioned, in terms of safety, you know, can be very helpful. There are reasons to be anxious. Um, for example, you know, if you're thinking about crossing the street, right, and a car is coming towards you, yeah, you should be anxious, like get out of the way, <laughs> right? Or you can have some helpful anxiety in terms of planning so that if you see a car coming, you stop, you look both ways, um, and you save yourself, okay? But then there is anxiety that can be very harmful. So for instance, using the kind of um, crossing the street example, um, if you are always afraid of crossing the street and um, feel that there's a threat that a car is going to come out of nowhere when you're looking at the street and there is no car there, um, and you're still worrying, and maybe you're even worrying about stepping off the curb, that is harmful anxiety. Um, it's perceived anxiety as getting in the way of doing what you need to do in everyday life. So child anxiety specifically, all kids have some fears. <laughs> if you have kids, you know that. Um, and about 10 to 30% of children and adolescents develop an anxiety disorder, meaning that the anxiety really gets in the way of what they need and want to do in their everyday life. Anxiety tends to stick with the person over time. If it's not treated, it persists over time um, unless something is done to learn how to deal with the anxiety. And if it goes untreated, that anxiety can exist into adulthood and it can even get worse and um, get in the way of things that people need and want to do as adults. So typical worries in early childhood, um, certainly separation from caregivers, loud noises, strangers, the dark is very common, dogs, insects. Um, and as you think about it, as we come up on Halloween, of course, you know, imaginary figures, monsters, ghosts, vampires, costumed characters, sometimes cl like clowns. Um, some kids love clowns. Some kids are petrified of clowns. And typical worries for school age children are um, certainly sickness, physical injury, health death, they might become aware in school age um, that there are health, certainly health challenges, sometimes their own, sometimes their families, that death exists. School performance is a common fear, um, athletic performance. Um, when peers reject a, um, reject a child or they feel like they're not liked by their peers or their friends. And then this awareness of natural disasters, a fear of earthquakes, floods, global warming. Typical worries for adolescents. So adolescents start caring even more about their friends and their peer group, right? So, um, so again, peer rejection or friends not liking them, peer pressure. Um, friends trying to get them to do things they might not want to do, um, anxiety about body image and how they look, health and death again, um, a starting a, maybe a worry about money in adolescence, romantic relationships, failure at academics, athletics, activities, um, any kind of failure, Fear about the future, adolescents start thinking, you know, forward, and that can be about becoming independent, getting a job, going to college, and world issues, a greater awareness that there's violence and political unrest, global warming, those kinds of things. So when is worry a problem? Um, when it causes significant distress and it has an impact on a child's daily functioning, um, for instance, uh, the child is afraid of the bus, 
um, and can't get on the school bus to get to school, um, when it's out of proportion to the actual threat or the danger, when it no longer serves the protective function, maybe, maybe the fear was helpful and now it's preventing a child from doing the things they want or need to do, um, and when it interferes with the child's ability to access needed medical care. And I'm gonna turn it over to Elisa. So what does problematic anxiety look like? How would you know it exists? So if you see your child and they're complaining about things like pain, dizziness, tiredness, their stomach hurting, uh, anxiety can take that form. Also, you might wonder if your child's anxious, if they have trouble sleeping, they're not concentrating as they normally do, they're avoiding activities that you know bring them worry. So if they're afraid about a dental appointment, they're afraid that they're avoiding going, or they're afraid about a situation at soccer, they're trying not to go there. If they have more difficulty than usual separating from their caregivers, they have anticipatory anxiety, which means ahead of time they're worrying about things. So they're worrying about their um, physical for next year, and this one, the one this year already happened. So it's way too far ahead to be worrying about that. If they're seeking reassurance all the time, with, with that reassurance providing little relief, so if they say, is my finger going to be okay? And you say, actually, it's fine. And they say 10 minutes later, is my finger really going to be okay? You know that the reassurance isn't really working to make them feel better. They're still worrying. And, amuse, and it's not amusingly, but it's sort of strange that sometimes things that look like um, not behaving well, like acting out in situations or being irritable or cranky, can also be signs of too much worry or anxiety. So specifically in the medical setting, uh, there are some really good reasons why kids might be anxious about that. So, and, and there are studies to look at that. So Part of it is because of their previous experiences at the doctor, maybe they had an immunization or maybe they went to the dentist and they had a cavity filled or something happened that they're holding on to as an experience that didn't feel good to them. They also often in medical environments have to meet new people and that stranger anxiety can kick in. Sometimes they don't understand the language or people are talking in ways that create misunderstandings. Sometimes their worry has to do with a doctor touching them or a nurse touching them or having to take off their clothes. Uh, also, the questions that are asked by a person they don't know very well. I remember my daughter asking me, why does, why does she have to know that about the pediatrician? And I had to explain why that would be an important thing for someone to ask in order to know all about her health. Also fear of having an illness, a worry that if they go to the doctor, they'll find that something's wrong. Uh, and along with that, their fear, what will be done to make that situation that might be wrong better, such as being able to, to, being able to eat what they want if they're told that they have something like celiacs, that they can't eat the same foods. They might be asked to take medicines, which might be hard for them, or to do exercises as in a physical therapist might ask them to do that. And sometimes kids don't report their symptoms because they're so worried about having something found as a problem that will lead them to do to thing things that they don't want to do. And also exposure to negative images of medical situations in the media uh, by themselves or their friend or even their friends reporting on things that have happened to them can be very scary. I also remember with my daughter, she was, I was picking her up to have uh, an immunization and I uh, was picking her up early at school and she said, uh, where are we going? I said, we're going and you're going to get a, you're going to get a poke at the doctors. And her friends were like, no, 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 that's horrible. And her anxiety went right up just because a lot of kids are afraid of things that happen in a medical environment. But how did those medical, what are those specific things that kids are worried about in a medical environment? So fear of needles or what we call pokes is a very common fear. And in fact, if you want to watch on our Boston Children's Hospital YouTube playlist, we have some specific webinars about these specific medical fears. If you were to want to watch those, Gail will tell you more at the end of our talk. Fear of medical providers, such as called the white coat syndrome, as soon as you see a doctor, some people become afraid. Discomfort with the environment, such as the sights, sounds, smells, and equipment. Uh, dental fear is very common also for kids. 
and fears re specific fears related to the equipment, such as blood pressure, cuffs, stethoscopes can be seen in kids. Just a general fear of going to the doctor's office is very present for many kids. So what does medical anxiety look like? And, and parts of it are very typical and normal. Most of us, when we're going to a doctor's office, have like a normal uh, range of anxiety, just a little bit of worry about it. And actually, I was telling my colleagues this morning that um, my blood pressure is really normal, but when I go to see the doctor, if they check it right away, uh, it can be a little high. So I often ask them to take a minute when I know my blood pressure is going to be taken. And then I do some deep breathing and relaxation and can almost always get it into my typical normal range. But I was going to say, it's a sign for me that even though I don't think I'm very anxious about going to the doctor, that that I am. And I think some of that is normal, normal range. But when is it medical anxiety that's more worrisome or something that you'd want to do something about? So when your child is reassurance seeking about their health quite frequently, and they're saying, am I going to be okay? What's going to happen? Uh, do I have a fever? Those kinds of questions. And, and when it seems like it's either out of nowhere or quite frequently, that's something to see as medical anxiety. If they report uh, the thoughts and questions that are about medical worries, such as those that I just said, am I okay? Uh, will my foot be okay? What about my um, heart? Is my heart working? Those kinds of questions. Checking behaviors, like asking you to take their blood pressure or their temperature, feel their head check their their boo-boos. Now, some again, some of this is normal. How many kids have a boo-boo that they've had for years that they want you to check repeatedly that's a little scar to make sure it's okay? Again, some of that is typical, but when it seems like it's interfering with their everyday life or coming up very frequently that you have to wonder about it, if they're constantly talking or thinking about medical topics, and these are a little bit for older kids, but if they're searching up their health or other health-related topics, on the internet for answers. Also something to note as anxiety and probably to discourage instead to write down their questions to ask one of their medical providers. We also see panic in medical settings that we're gonna to wanna to help kids with, things where they're screaming, crying, hiding. You see, their, see them sweating, um, they look red. Obviously not our wish for kids in a medical setting. Also, kids can have nightmares and report that they're thinking all the time about their medical experiences. These are just some things that you can sort of note uh, in your child to say, wow, I think the medical anxiety is a little more than it should be. So what do we do about it? So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the strategies that are part of what's seen in psychotherapy as the gold standard treatment, which is cognitive behavioral therapy, which you'll hear, hear referred to as CBT. Uh, they've done a lot of research on, on these techniques and found that they're very effective for treating anxiety, uh, including medically-based anxiety. And it really focuses on those connections between how you think and how that leads to how you feel and how you behave. And we're gonna think about ways you can apply parts of CBT with your child, just realizing that we're not asking you to do psychotherapy with your child, but some of these principles can fit into daily family life uh, in your management of your child's worry. So how does it develop? What's the cognitive behavioral theory about how it develops? I'm going to give a specific example, which is, let's say your child is afraid of dogs and every time they're walking down the street and see a dog, they're very afraid. So for them, the st stressful situation is seeing a dog. Uh, the misinterpreting of the threat, I mean, obviously dogs can be scary. They can bark. They can be afraid that they'll bark, bark or bite or jump on you. But the threat posed by every dog is not as serious as they imagine it would. So they misinterpret the threat as very dangerous. And that creates anxiety. So you can imagine if someone thinks dogs are great, I love dogs, they're gonna to run towards that um, golden retriever that's walking by them on the street and feel very happy about seeing it. So you see how that thought, I love dogs, dogs are great and fun, drives behavior where you don't feel threatened and you feel, wow, how wonderful I'm going to see a dog. If you think a dog is gonna jump on you, bite or bark or be dangerous to you, then, um, then you're, then you're going to be anxious and worried. 
And usually what people do when they're worried is avoid situations. It's a little bit about what Annie was talking about earlier with um, flight, fight, and, and freeze. So if you're really afraid, you might do what most people do is try to run away, or you could freeze and just freeze and spot. And many people have seen their children do that, just be unable to move or fight where they're pulling on you or fighting on you not to walk by that dog on the street. But usually what people do when in a fearful situation is they avoid it and it makes them immediately feel better. So they see the golden retriever walking towards them on the street and they get you to turn around, you walk away, you never walk by the dog. And so they never get the information and that dog really was lovely and a delightful dog to interact with who wouldn't have barked, bit or jumped on them. So um, they get no information. That means that the next time they see a dog, they're going to be just as frightened, if not more, and be more likely to try to avoid them. So that's how we sort of see anxiety develop. And, you know, obviously with some dogs, some dogs are meant to be avoided and you can see a dog who's gnarling at you or, and, and then it is the wise thing to avoid it. That's why it's complex because you want to interpret the situation for the average situation where a dog is not, most dogs are not really threatening. So fears can spread to other things. In the case of the fear of dogs, I've known many children who are afraid of dogs who just, who wouldn't want to go outside of their home. They were so afraid of dogs that they didn't want to go to a friend's house if the friend happened to have a dog or every time they were invited to a play date, they would say, do they have a dog before they would be willing to go? I recently had a child who um, was in a, a middle school and they were going to have a therapy dog day where dogs were going to come to school and she refused to go to school on that day, again, attempting to avoid the dog. So you can see it spread to fear of, um, you know, leaving your home, walking by dogs, going to specific places. So that's what we really don't want these fears to spread in this way. And let's say you were afraid of something in a hospital setting. We use the example of a dental appointment. Um, let's say then you're afraid of, become afraid of brushing your teeth, or you're afraid of going to any doctor's appointment, or even walking by the dentist's office. The pictures here are meant to show that sometimes if you're afraid of one thing in a medical setting, it might become the whole hospital, it might become masks, it might become any medical equipment, even play equipment that you're afraid of. So how does CBT help us lower anxiety? So here we have the stressful situation where uh, the child was misinterpreting the threat as dangerous, as the dog being very dangerous. What we're going to try to get them to do is reevaluate that threat so that we can reduce the anxiety. And we're going to talk about some of the strategies to do this as the talk goes on. I'm trying to tell you why we want to do that first. So if they reevaluate the stress and they don't have to move to, I love dogs, but they could move to, I can walk by that dog without that dog being dangerous, then they're going to have less or no anxiety then they can stay in the situation. Their fear goes up. It's going to be more than if they avoid it. If they walk by that dog on the street, they're going to have more fear than they would have otherwise. But then it goes down when they walk by and something bad doesn't happen. And they start to accurately measure danger. They start to say, hey, maybe not every dog is really dangerous. Hey, maybe I can walk down the street. Hey, maybe I can go to that friend's house who has a dog without it being a danger to me. So what are these uh, CBT strategies we're gonna talk about? I'm going to preview a few of them. One is we're gonna talk uh, about how to educate yourself and your child about anxiety so you can become the expert on how to manage it. Like how does anxiety work and how is your child gonna face it? Even for them to know what we just talked about, which is facing some of the things that you're worried about in a safe way can make it better for you. We're going to talk about relaxation skills. Gail's going to go over that and how relaxation can lower your overall body thermostat. Uh, we're going to talk about cognitive reappraisal, which is a really big way to say helping you think a different way about the things you're afraid of. So you can identify the th kinds of thoughts that make it harder to go through daily life and the ones that make it easier. And then we're going to talk about exposure, which is how you safely and gradually approach those things you're afraid of instead of avoiding them so that you can change how you think about them. And part of that is trying to understand the difference between true versus false alarms. So actually, you're 
anxiety is a good thing for the most part uh, for the body's alarm system in many situations, but we want to have the alarms be true alarms. So in the situation where your child's about to cross the street and they're about to walk right in front of a car and all of your all of your body alarm systems go off and you grab your child quickly and pull them so that they're not hit by a car, you're probably your heart rate went up. You're, that's a true alarm. And that was alarm you needed to pay attention to to get your child to safety. But it's a false alarm to think that it's dangerous. I know a lot of kids are a lot worried about a lot of things that aren't really something that's worrisome at all, like Martians coming to school, for example. That's a false alarm if you're really worried about that. And when your body responds to going to school as if there are going to be Martians there, we want to get that more set to what a true alarm should be. And in that case, that's not an alarm that makes sense. So there are rational times to feel anxiety, a little bit about what Annie was talking about, good, helpful anxiety versus the kind of anxiety that gets in the way of doing what you want to do. And it's just two things here I want to say before passing it to Gail, which is you don't you don't really want your anxiety to be zero. Um, so for me, I'm kind of glad that I'm afraid of jumping off a building and doing bungee jumping, because for me, I feel like that really is dangerous. And um, I'm glad I have the alarm that tells me not to do that. But honestly, um, I'm glad, I, but I wouldn't want to have that alarm about going to work, for example. So finding those uh, alarms and when they are, where they need to be. Most kid parents want their kids to be a little anxious about getting good grades because that little bit of anxiety gets them to study. But we want, don't want them so anxious that they're immobilized, unable to study. Uh, it's kind of like we sort of say to kids uh, when we're trying to get them to do some of this work with us, that we don't expect their anxiety to be zero. That's not even our goal. We want them to have a little anxiety because um, that's what makes you brave. Brave is facing the things you're anxious about. It doesn't mean that you have none at all. And with that, I will pass it to Gail. So we're gonna just start off by talking about um, things that caregivers, parents um, do that can actually make children's anxiety worse. Um, so anxiety is kind of contagious. And so if a say your um your child is gonna get a shot and they said, Oh my god, it's gonna hurt, and they and you go, Oh yeah, it is, it's gonna hurt. I had a shot yesterday. That's actually gonna make it worse for them because they're gonna you're you're agreeing with them. And rather than saying, you know what, it's quick, it might be a little pinch, but then you're gonna be okay and it's gonna feel better very quickly. Um, that can be much more helpful than re, um, than saying that they're, you know, yeah, that it's going to be bad. So staying calm and just, you know, being honest about the situation and explaining to them the reality of what it is. And for the example shot, the reality is that, yeah, it might feel like a little pinch and then it'll be better. Um, so we can respond to children's anxiety in different ways. Um, one is reinforcing, which is what I just talked about is, you know, saying things that are going to make it them feel like, yeah, they should worry. Um, another response would be minimizing it, um, which can also sometimes be a problem because then kids, you know, say, oh, no, it's not going to be a problem at all. Shot's not going to hurt. Um, that's not helpful because then when they go and have a shot and it does hurt, even if it hurts a little, they're going to they're not going to trust you next time you tell them that it's not going to hurt. So being very honest and concrete about the situation is the best approach. And then unhelpful reassurance is this can also be hard on or not not helpful for kids. And that's when you say, oh, don't worry, it's going to be fine. It'll be, you know, everything's everything's going to work out perfectly. You don't have to worry. It's not going to hurt at all. Um, that, again, is not being honest and it's not helpful for the child. Um, and the other thing to recognize is that you may have your own anxiety about your child's health and medical situation. And one thing you can do to help um, when you do go to the doctor is try to get a hold of your own anxiety. And some of the techniques we're gonna talk about relaxing, you can apply to yourself. Um, we are gonna be talking about um, different uh, ways of reducing anxiety in children. And we're also planning to have a talk that is gonna be specifically for adults in terms of how to help them um, 
how to help caregivers manage their own anxieties. But some of the techniques for kids can easily be applied to parents as well. Um, so we are going to move on to um, relaxation. So relaxation, um, there's several different techniques for relaxing. One is doing deep breathing. And there's different ways of doing that. So for example, if you have bubbles, which unfortunately you can't use at the hospital anymore, um, but you can use them outside or at home if you're comfortable with that in your house. Um, and there's different ways of doing the bubbles. So if a child, child, children can experiment with it and you can encourage them to experiment. They can experiment with taking deep breaths in and then taking a large breath out slowly. And that's going to actually make them form a really big bubble. And if they just blow consistently, there's going to be a whole series of bubbles. And then if they breathe like short little breaths, like that's going to make the bubbles sort of pop out and come back in and pop out and come back in. And those are all different kinds of breathing techniques that they can play with and learn by using the bubbles. Other things they can use are um, a pinwheel. And that is acceptable to use in, a, in the hospital. And, and some of the areas of the hospital actually have them available. And that also is just breathing in and then blowing the pinwheel. Another um, fun thought way of thinking about deep breathing is if you have a bowl of soup and you want to smell the soup and it smells delicious and you want to try it, but you know it's hot. So you're going to breathe on the spoon and then taste it. And if you think about it, you're gonna smell the soup and then you're gonna breathe on the spoon. That's your deep in breathing and out breathing. And then finally over here is another technique, which is either called infinity breathing or figure eight breathing. And with this, the idea is that you can count to three as you're breathing in, and you can also follow the line with your fingers. So you breathe in for three, and then follow it again, breathing out for three and continuing to do that so that you're doing continuous deep breathing. And all these things are important to practice ahead of time. Um, waiting till you're in a situation where you're anxious is not the best time to learn how to do these breathing techniques. Just like say you, um, say you wanna use a bicycle to go to work every morning and you've never learned how to use a bike. Well, to get on the bicycle when you have a half an hour to get to work and you've never been on the bike is not going to work very well. You're going to try to jump on and ride and if you've never ridden it before. You're not going to be able to do it. So in the same way as you would, if, you're, if you know you're going to use your bike to get to work and you've never ridden a bike, you're going to learn how to ride it first. You're going to practice and you're going to keep practicing until you're very comfortable with it so that then you can apply it to the situation where you can drive, you know, use it to get to work. Well, relaxation techniques are very similar to that. If you learn how to do it and become sort of part of you and you don't have to think about it as much, then if you find one or two different ways that work for you, then you can just automatically, when you get anxious, incorporate that into your behavior so that it helps you relax and you can feel better in the situation. So another, these are some other different ways of using relaxation. These are different relaxation techniques. Um, one is, these are called guided imagery. Um, this one is about your five senses. And different people talk about this in different ways. There's a five, four, three, two, one um, approach to this. And one is to that approach, you would think about five different things that you see and then four different things that you might touch and how they feel, um, three different things you might be hearing. Um, you can listen to the area around you, or you can just imagine hearing a band playing or hearing the beach, being at the beach and hearing the calm waves. Um, and then you would think of two things that you might smell or you smell sitting there and one thing that you would taste. Um, the other approach of using your five senses is to start by closing your eyes and taking some deep breaths and then just feeling yourself where you are. So for example, if you're sitting on the couch, feeling the comfortable cushions, if you're wearing a soft shirt, feeling the soft shirt, and really just focusing on how you're feeling in that particular situation at that time.
And then you move on to the next sense. So you think about what you hear. So you still have your eyes closed. And if you're in your house by yourself, you might hear the birds outside or if it's raining, you might hear the rain that's pattering on the window. Um, you might hear the refrigerator motor going or the heat turning on. Um, but you're really focusing on the things that you hear. And then move on to the sense of your sense of smell. What do you smell? You know, are there brownies cooking in the oven? Um, or it, sometimes you don't smell anything really. And that's okay too. And you can think about um, that you're not smelling anything, or you can think about what you might like to smell, like the cookies or brownies cooking. Um, and then you can think about taste. Um, sometimes you have remnants of you having brushed your teeth and it, you you can taste that minty flavor that's in your mouth or um, what you just ate for breakfast. Um, and then you can open your eyes and look around and see the things around you. You might see the trees or the sun or birds flying by or the blue sky or the rain coming down. Um, and then close your eyes again and think about all the things you've thought about and do some breathing again. And that's another process of using your five senses. Um, the next one we're talking about is calming medica meditation for kids. Um, if you, you can Google um, different types of meditation. Um, one uh, suggestion is going to PBS for kids. Um, they have some meditations. And the other thing is to think about what do you or your child enjoy? So you can also Google like sitting on the beach and listening to the waves. There's actually videos of the being on the beach and having the waves crashing. And if that's something that brings you calmness, that can be helpful. Or, um, or other situations, being in the woods or listening to rain. All these things can be found online. Um, so you can actually bring yourself to those situations from your home to, to help you be calm. Um, another form of relaxation is called progressive muscle relaxation. And we have two examples of these. This first one is um, you're going to focus on um, squeezing lemons. You're going to take your hands and pretend you have lemons in them, and you're going to squeeze hard and count to 10. And then you're going to release the lemons and let your arms drop and relax. And then you're going on to stretch like a cat. And you're going to pretend you're a cat that just woke up from a nap. You're going to stretch your arms up in front of you as high as you can and hold that stretch for 10 seconds and then relax again. And then finally, hiding in a in your shell, pretending you're a turtle and pulling your head into your shell, pulling your shoulders up um, and pushing your head down and your shoulders up too and holding that tight and then relaxing. And that tension and then relaxing will help you feel more relaxed overall. And in the same way as you did that, another approach is doing each part of your body, starting with the bottom, um, with your toes and your feet and tensing them for five seconds and then relaxing them. Um, and you might wanna start with taking some deep breaths just to help you focus on each part of your body and move from your feet to your legs, to your stomach, all the way to the top of your head. And then again, close your eyes and take your deep breaths. And these are ways of helping your muscles. You tense them and relax them and it helps your body have an overall feeling of relaxation. And now we're gonna turn it back to Elisa. Excellent. Thank you, Gilda. I feel relaxed just having had you go through that. That was amazing. So here we have Anxiety Girl, who's able to face the worst prediction in a single bound. So when we think about cognitive reappraisal, we're trying to think about that difference between I, I love dogs, dogs are okay, and dogs are really dangerous, or going to the doctor um, is okay, I'll get through it, that might help my health versus uh, no way, that's going to hurt. I've got to get out of here and avoid it, those kinds of things. So trying to get kids to have another way to think about the things they're afraid of can often really help. And that's why we're trying to do some of that not avoiding. But part, part of that not avoiding helps to think about it. So let's say your child is afraid of dogs. Um, thinking about what would I tell a friend if they were worried about dogs? What would a friend say to me? Or what do my friends say to me about their dogs? What's the evidence for my idea about my worry being true that dogs are really dangerous? 
has anyone I know really had a bad experience with a dog? Again, this is an example of one where the answer might be yes, but it's you still want to be able to go out on the street and walk around when dogs are around. So am I 100% certain that when I walk by a dog, I'll get bitten or barked or jumped on? Uh, what's the worst case scenario? Will my parents protect me if they're with me? What will happen? I like to think of it as the three questions and the three questions are sort of like, let's say it, let's say we're staying in our dog story. Um, um, am I likely to see a dog? The answer is yes. If we go out, might I see a dog when I'm walking around? How bad would it be if I saw a dog? And if you're very afraid, the answer is very bad. But if you're, you know, I mean, you would say, all right, it would be a scary situation for me, but I'm not sure what I would do. Then the biggest question here is what skills do I have to manage it? And the skill I have to manage it is uh, breathing, holding my Karen's hand, looking straight ahead, um, thinking about other thoughts, all of, whatever the skills that you've developed with your child are, you want them thinking about what am I afraid of? Is it something really to be afraid of or not? I I've done this with kids about things that are much less likely than walking by a dog, such as what um, I had a child who was afraid that, you know, when she um, when she went to her have a surgery, she was afraid that they would use the bad parts to help her, that they wouldn't use new or fresh fresh equipment to help her. And and I said, so how likely is that to be true? Well, not very likely. Um, what would happen if it was? Well, that wouldn't be good for my for my health. What skills do I have to manage it? And in that particular case, she wrote out her fears to her surgeon, brought it into the appointment and talked to the surgeon who showed her exactly how they pick the materials that they use, exactly how they're going to do it. And she went into that surgery, not afraid at all. She actually drew a comic strip of her worry before the surgery when she was really worried about what would happen and what they would do. Then after the doctor, when she saw what would, what she thought really would happen, um, and, and when she finished it and she actually did, the, I asked her to draw another cartoon at the end, she drew a cartoon of how it really turned out, which was even better than her imagining after talking to the doctor. So part of it is also figuring out what your kids are worried about and whether it's realistic or not. Nobody could have imagined that her worry was that they would use equipment that wasn't new or that was dirty to help her in a surgery. So exposure, we're going to talk a little bit about it. after you've worked on the thoughts, part of the part of what you need to do next is get your child to safely and gradually interact with the situations they're afraid of. And we do this through our bravery ladder, which we can use to track progress. And also we can apply to a variety of scary situations uh, for your child. But what I would say is what we want to do is personalize it to your child. So we have an example coming up next on the next slide. But that that example, this is meant for any child. Some children might be less afraid to sit in the waiting room of a doctor's office. Uh, they might be less afraid of that than they would be to look at pictures of medical equipment. So you have to figure out your own child and what their worries are and how worried they are about the different parts of it. So what we have here are the steps in the bravery ladder that you're going to want to do one at a time so your child starts to feel successful about facing the worry. So for example, in the situation of the dog, we don't uh, take a child who's afraid of dogs and make them sit in the middle of a dog park to overcome their worry. That would be going to step eight as opposed to what might be a simpler step such as watching Clifford on television. So in the case of a fear of medical visits, we might start with looking at pictures of medical equipment that's cartoon-like and not even realistic, which is probably less scary than looking at realistic photographs of medical equipment. Let's say their specific worry about the doctor is medical equipment, such as uh, getting their blood pressure taken. So they might watch a video on YouTube that you've screened first to make sure it's appropriate of a child going to a medical visit, getting their blood pressure taken. You might get them a pretend blood pressure cuff, a play one that's very unrealistic that they play with with their stuffed animals, dolls, with you or a sibling. Then you might actually get a real blood pressure cuff or one that's more realistic. Now, once you're going up this ladder, you're doing each of these steps several times, three, four, five times till they feel really comfortable with it and like they've mastered it and like it's no longer as scary. You might walk by the doctor's office where the blood pressure cuff lives as well as the doctors, nurses, and other medical staff. 
you might go to the office of the doctor and sit in the waiting room. For me, um, when I used to work in um, 300 Longwood and kids were afraid of appointments, they'd come and see me and the appointments weren't that threatening. So that was already exposure coming to the hospital and seeing another provider and having a good experience or one that didn't involve anything scary. Um, I had kids who were afraid of blood pressure cuffs and we had blood pressure cuffs in psychiatry that I could bring and show them and let them touch. That was that. But we'd also go to the waiting room and just play with toys in the waiting room of places where they needed to go for their appointments. So sticking with our blood pressure steps, our next step might be going to the doctor's office. Uh, I always love it when you have like a stuffed animal, uh, like one of those monkeys that has really long arms and legs and letting the doctor show what's gonna happen or the nurse or whoever the provider is showing what's gonna happen on that stuffed animal first and um, having that and then going to the to the pediatrician for that examination with a blood pressure cuff. Now we see the fear re rating on step eight as 10. Hopefully that's at the start, but once they've gone through all these steps and felt some success at each step, they're gonna feel better and it won't feel like a 10 when they enter, um, when they enter the doctor's office for that, um, for that appointment once they've done these earlier steps. So part of what we do with this also is, you know, think about all the ways we can provide exposure or a, a, a ways to approach the fear around medical visits. One very common one is to play out medical situations with toys, reading books about bodies and medical visits. For example, I have this Daniel visits the hospital. You can't see it well because I'm blurred. I'm sorry, but um, I, I will maybe show it later. Uh, but you have books like there's plenty of books and videos about visiting doctors and going through exactly what they need to do. Uh, encourage the caregiver to model healthy coping skills. So for the, and we're not encouraging you to do that, to model your own healthy coping behaviors. For example, see these exercises I'm doing. My physical therapist said doing them will help me walk more easily or modeling taking your medicine. All of that uh, makes it easier. Uh, and, and when it's appropriate, your child can attend a visit with a parent or sibling. Also, a very good resource is My Hospital Story, which we have. I uh, was created, uh, I think, by Child Life and the Autism Program. I, I hope I'm crediting the right people. But there's pictures of going through each step of many things, such as getting your blood pressure taken. or go, And there's pictures of places in the hospital. Those are also really good for exposure and also for giving your child a sense of what will happen to them during a medical visit. And, and just to pipe in, if you Google um, Boston Children's Hospital, my hospital stories, you'll get access to a whole list of different stories and what they're about. Um, as as Lisa said, like taking your blood pressure, getting a vaccination, et cetera. And at the different sites at Boston Children's. So if you really want them to see where they really will be, that's a slightly more accurate exposure. I think going, sometimes seeing a friend or a parent have uh, that, like let's say the blood pressure is their worry, having them see them have their blood pressure um, checked is also another way to provide exposure. So we sort of think about ways to provide, get more information about their worries, but also to provide some pairing or reward so that they feel better and see that they've made progress. So you can use a reward chart for every step along the exposure hierarchy, hierarchy or bravery ladder. So you can say you did step one. How hard was that? So this one is about pain, this monitor where we have no pain to 10 is the worst possible pain. But you could also do that with worry, no worry, worst worry. Like, okay, they did, they um, went walked by the doctor's office how worrisome was that for them? And then they can get their sticker for having done it. Um, and if there's a, sometimes the best reward is that they're seeing that their worry or their pain is going down. That's very rewarding. That's the biggest reward. But some kids like something tangible, like they can have a prize or an activity with you. It doesn't have to be expensive. In fact, if you told me that you were going to give your child an American Girl doll or an Xbox for getting their blood pressure taking, I would say that's a mistake because that's signaling that those tasks are super hard. If you know that you're going to get, if you tell your parent, I'm going to give you an Xbox for doing that, they're like, oh my gosh, that's probably going to really be awful. If you tell them you're going to give them a cupcake, they're like, okay, that's reasonable and that might not be that hard. So think carefully about the rewards you choose to give and how they 
uh, make the child feel better and, and like they've accomplished something, but don't signal that something's hard. So again, um, using these kinds of charts are also a nice visual representation about how much success they've made and the progress they've made in doing the thing they're worried about, also how it's less painful and less scary to them. With that, I'm turning it back to Gail. So um, now we're going to talk a little bit about anxiety prevention. So there's different things that you can do to help your child feel less anxious. Um, and it's a, you have to talk to your child about what are they anxious about and what's making their life um, a situation where there's anxiety. Um, so there's the specific anxieties that Elisa was addressing, but there's also if you can decrease stress in general in their life, that can help with everything. So for example, if they have a very busy schedule um, and they're um, they're trying to, um, I'm sorry, uh, say they go to school and then after school they um, have sports activities and then they have to do homework and they take a, they take a music lesson and then they go to, um, and then they have to help with the dishes and all these different things during their day, it becomes too much for them. And so we try to decrease their stress by talking about what can we eliminate in their schedule without making, um, without taking away the things that they really enjoy. Um, and also finding times during the day that they can relax and, or even during the week that they can relax some downtime so that they have an opportunity to sort of de-stress to become more relaxed and not to have all this on all these responsibilities on them. And today's kids have a lot that they're pressured to do um, because their peers are doing it and other parents hear that they're doing it. So it's really important to find that balance for your child as an individual to figure out what, what's the best amount of things for them to do that they can handle. Um, in addition to that, um, helping them um, develop really good sleep patterns can help decrease anxiety. Um, having a bedtime, a, re a realistic bedtime and time that they need to get up and help them in, be in an environment where the sleep can be good, like not having a TV on all night um, or the radio on, having a quiet, dark environment that helps them sleep eating healthy foods and on a regular schedule, not, in, not rushing out the door and forgetting to have breakfast. Um, that can be very difficult on some kids. Um, my kids often will say that I'm hangry, um, which means that they're angry because they haven't eaten. Um, and it's a combination, the words combined is angry and hungry. Um, so that can remind you that sometimes kids just don't do well when they haven't eaten. Um, so having breakfast, lunch, dinner, and maybe a snack after school can be a great situation and making sure that those the snacks and the food are, are healthy ones. Exercise is also incredibly um, beneficial to reduce anxiety. As a matter of fact, my brother um, swims and tries to swim every single day. And there's times when, you know, life just gets in the way and he'll be so anxious about something and he'll all of a sudden, and I'll be talking to him, he said, you know what, I realized I didn't swim today or yesterday. So I'm going to go to the pool. I'll talk to you later. And so for him, swimming is his way of getting his anxiety out. And you could, and often when I see him or talk to him, I can tell if he swam that day because he is more relaxed and feels it just, you can tell that there isn't that tension. Um, and then also finding quiet time to relax, to do deep breathing, to do some of the things we talked about in terms of relaxation techniques. Um, also figuring out what your child's specific worries are. And we've, um, the Family Medical Coping Initiative has done a whole series of uh, webinars just like this one on specific um, things that kids worry about. So for example, um, about medical visits, about having vaccinations, um, about following through with their recommendations their doctor gave. And on the screen here, you'll see a QR code. You can either um, use your camera on your phone to scan it and you'll be able to go to our, the Family uh, Medical Coping Initiative has a playlist on the Boston Children's Hospital YouTube channel. Um, and it'll take you to all the webinars that we've offered. And with time, 
they slowly will be added. So eventually this particular talk will be added as well as some others that haven't been added. Um, additional ones that are already there are ones on um, managing children's um, staring, teasing, and bullying about medical differences, Pers having managing persistent pain and helping siblings of children that have medical conditions. Those are some other examples as well as others. So I'm going to give you a second to either take a screenshot or um, use your camera to scan the QR code. Um, more resources might be, as um, Elisa mentioned, our books. Um, so these are some examples of books that might help children um, explore medical, so children's books about exploring medical needs, um, 10 great children's books about talking about surgery. So if you Google these topics, you'll find um, there, you'll find the, um, these examples. The other thing is if you, you know, buying medical play medical kits can be expensive. And if you take a look here at this top right corner, this is a paper stethoscope. And down here are um, YouTube channels that teach you how to make a paper stethoscope and a paper syringe. And it's a fun project, especially if your kid likes to do arts and crafts. And if you just Google um, D DIY paper medical equipment, you'll see you'll come to these particular YouTube channels and it's it makes it really fun um, to make them and then practice with them. Um, also, there's some really great books out there. There's ones for younger kids and we've listed them here. I won't read them all, but if you Google books for young children, these will come up. There's also ones that are specifically for older kids. Um, many of them talk about um, their bodies because their bodies are changing so much. So it's important for them to understand the changes that are happening. Um, and you can see these are suggestions of different books they might want to, um, you might want to go to the library and take a look at with your child or let them look at them by themselves. A lot of times kids are embarrassed to see, to look at some of these books, especially the older kids. So, you know, just helping them find it and then say, oh, why don't you take a look at these? And I'm gonna go look at some other things in the library. We hope that you enjoy the presentation, learn some tools um, to work with your kids. And as I said, um, a recording of this presentation will be coming to you as a registrant um, of this webinar. Thank you. Thank you. And have a great day, everybody.